appreciate you all here this morning. Matthew chapter 12, I believe you're here for a reason. Matthew 12 verse 14 says, And the Pharisees went out and held counsel against him, that is against the Lord Jesus, how they might destroy him. When Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, or Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, and whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him in so much that the blind and the dumb both speak and saw. Let's stop there. Keep your Bible open. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for this time of worship. We want to thank you for your anointed spirit and presence. We want to thank you, Lord, that you're here in the midst of us. We give you glory this morning. Lord, you're worthy of the praise and worthy of more than we ever give to you. So now, Father, shut ourselves in with yourself. Lord, that we would see and know and understand this morning that you even have us in this place. Lord, you have us to hear your word and to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, that you will speak to our hearts and encourage your people. So Father, undertake, we pray, and give us the ability to listen. And give us opening ears, opened ears and an open heart to receive the word of the living God. Bless those this morning who are away, those who are unable to come this morning for one reason or another. Bless those who are still in mourning, especially the Heinz family. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you'd minister into every situation, that you'd glorify your name in this house and in our hearts and in our lives. We ask it for Jesus' name's sake and for his glory alone. Amen. I want to speak this morning on the withered hand, the bruised reed, and the smoking flex. The withered hand the bruised reed, and the smoking flax. To say I had another message, but this is what the Lord gave me just yesterday. And I finished it yesterday afternoon sometime. I believe it's for you. And our reading opens up in verse 14 with the Pharisees held a council against the Lord Jesus, how they might destroy him. Notice the language here, how they might destroy him. The word here, apolomai, for destroy, it can mean to put to death, to totally put out of the way, or it can even mean to ruin one's reputation completely. So in other words, these men gathered together how they might ruin his reputation, then put him to death. Completely to punish him, it means. And so it's a, it's a council that gathers of these men. And brothers and sisters, don't be surprised. Christian, don't be surprised whenever you find that sometimes there's a council who gathers to gather against you uh, because of your standing for the truth. Because God's anointing you, don't always expect the blessing to come from other people. Always rely on the blessing only to come from God and you'll do okay. Because once you expect blessing from others because God's blessing you, you're going to find that you're looking in the wrong direction. The Lord here who is anointed with the Spirit above measure, he finds that these men are gathered together. They have a counsel to destroy him, to totally tear him down and destroy his very reputation. Not only destroy his reputation, but lead him eventually into death, to catch him in something that they may totally annihilate the Lord Jesus. How strange is it that when we read on the night of our Lord's uh, betrayal and 
the night of our Lord's arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then his trial before Pontius Pilate, that night he was with three enemies, one of another, and they all had joined together in unity. He was with Pontius Pilate. He was with Herod. He stood before them. He was with Annas and uh, and Caiaphas, the high priest, all who hated with a passion one another, but yet were able to gather together in unity in in order to destroy the Lord Jesus. Here's a council of men who have gathered together to take him down. So don't you be surprised when you take a stand whenever you preach the gospel or mention the name of Christ in a workplace when others maybe would gather together and take counsel of the things you're saying and they don't like it. Or even in church when others see the anointing on you and they don't like it. Notice this. They gather together a council to destroy him, to try and catch him on his word. wonder what his crime was. It must have been heinous must have been very grievous. It'll amaze, it never ceases to amaze me the things that people pick up from someone's life, the little things that people pick up from someone's uh, ministry to try and take it, to blow it out of proportion, to make it seem like a heinous crime when all they're really doing is serving the Lord to the best of their ability and then the capacity is allowed them to. It never ceases to amaze me because those who shout the most are those who do the least, brothers and sisters. Take note of it. And here we find that they, they, they have gathered together for some heinous crime our Lord must have committed. But what did he do? Let's look at our first point. And it's just before our reading in Matthew chapter 12. Just read verse 13. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. What was his heinous crime? He healed a man on the Sabbath day. How dare he do that? Does he not know you don't do those things on the Sabbath? Do you know then if you were walking past a wall and a wall fell on you, and you were still alive, they came to check on the Sabbath day, they could look to see if you're still alive. And if you're still alive, they could remove the rubble and bring you to a place of safety, but they had to leave you there to the next day, just in case it was counted as work. If you split yourself open, you could pour a little oil in, but you weren't allowed to bandage up in case it was counted as labor. Christ seen these things and looked upon them with disdain. And he says, you need to be set free from this. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You need to be set free from this mindset. Now notice this. Notice this. The man in the story of Matthew 12 verse 13 who was healed from this withered hand This man, we find that he's in the synagogue and Christ walks into a synagogue on the Sabbath day. He sits down to read and to teach. And as he sits down to read and to teach them the word of God, what happens? Here's a man who had a withered hand who was sitting in the synagogue and he's sitting there like he did any other Sabbath day. There's no difference when that man get up that morning on that Sabbath day. When that man opened his eyes and he's lying in his bed, his mind was, I'm going to the synagogue. Nothing different was in this man's life. Nothing. He still had a withered hand when he opened his eyes. He still had a withered hand when he dressed himself. He still had a withered hand when he walked to the synagogue. And he still had a withered hand as he sat there. He still had this withered hand. But little did this man know that this was the day when things would change. Little did he know that this was the day when his withered hand would be restored whole as the other. Little did he know that this was the day when he would meet the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, people give up at the last moment and turn back just before God's about to break in. Just about before God's about to move on that situation that he's had this withered hand for so long. 
People give up and they give up in prayer. They give up going on with God because they find it too hard and difficult. So they, they decide to stay away. In fact, of all the places they should be is in the place where God just might turn up. This man, it was an ordinary day to him. But by the time he left that synagogue, it was no ordinary day. He had an encounter with Christ. He had an encounter with Christ. The Lord Jesus calls him to stretch forth his hand. And the man in faith takes his withered hand and in faith he reaches forth toward Christ. And the hand that reaches towards Christ always finds the blessing in it. And as he reaches his hand forth in faith towards the Lord Jesus, what happens? His hand is restored as whole as the other. There's an old uh, papyrus of writing, and it's pretty torn up. It's, not, it's called the Gospel to the Hebrews. It's not the book of Hebrews that we have. And it tells of this also in that. And it speaks that this man was a builder, and he had an accident. And whether it was infection or damage done to the hand, the hand started to wither, and the muscles wasted, and the hand became useless. There's no social services, and this man finds that he's now in trouble. There's no social services. There's none to help. There's none to pay money every week to him. There's none to keep him in, in a lifestyle, and he finds that this man's life has totally changed because of one incident. I'm speaking to somebody with a withered hand this morning. Things has happened to you. Someone said something or your spiritual walk with the Lord is just not what it used to be and it's withered to somewhat, but you're here. But you're here. You know what it tells me because you're here? It tells me faith is still operating in your life. It tells me that you just haven't given up yet because you're still here. And this man with the withered hand, he, he used to labor with it, now he can do nothing with it. And maybe you've found out the things that you used to be good at for the Lord, the things you used to work hard at for the Lord, the, the walk you used to have with the Lord and the closeness you had with Him and the bond of fellowship and unity you had with Him no longer is it the same anymore, but it's withered. It's withered. And you've just come into church this morning. I'll just come in as usual. And it's just a usual Sunday where you get up and you get dressed and your hands still withered. But you've entered in here and we've worshipped and you've sensed the Lord is here. There's the presence of the Spirit and the team of led us into a lovely time of praise and worship. And it's, it's evident that God's in the midst. This morning, then Jesus says, you stretch forth your withered hand if you want to be restored. If you want to be restored, then stretch it forth. Lord, today's the day I hear your word and I answer the call. We sang as Gary and the team led us, as strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We expect him to do something. We wait upon the Lord. We wait upon the Lord. And this man here, he, he stretches forth his withered hand. His hand becomes restored as the other. I want to look at this word restored for a moment. It's a, it's a big long word. It's a, a pocket fest to me. And this is what it means. It means to restore to its former state. And it means to be in its former state. See, when Christ did it, he did a good job and he did, does all things well. And he restored right back to what it should have been. In other words, the accident, the thing that happened to him, no longer counted in his life. Something's happened to you. Something was said to you or something wasn't said to you that should have been said to you or you've been hurt or you've been injured or you've been damaged or something has crept in or something has happened that has withered you. This morning the Lord says, stretch it forth and I'll restore you back. And when I restore you back, I'll make you the way you should be. But here's the thing, the thing that happened to you in the past no longer counts in your life. Maybe you were damaged when you were younger. Maybe you were damaged in a relationship. The thing that happened to you will no longer count when you stretch out your damaged hand, the withered hand, and give it to God. The damaged hand goes, and he restores it the way it should be. He'll restore you this morning. The psalmist says, he restoreth my soul. 
This word means to be in a former state. Let me just look at it for a minute also. Just the word for restore. It was restored whole as the other. Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26, talks of the Lord Jesus is in the town of Bethsaida. And when he's in the town of Bethsaida, he comes across a man who is blind. We know the story. He spits and he anoints the man's eyes. And he asks the man if he sees anything. In verse 24 of Mark chapter 8, it says, And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Verse 25 says, And he put his hands upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. He was restored. His eyes were made to what they should have been. Whatever had happened to this man's eyes, whether this man's eyes were never fully formed, or whether this man's eyes had something early in life happen, or whether this man's eyes were damaged some other way, or maybe the orbs just didn't really grow right. Whatever had happened, Christ did a creative miracle in the man's life that the man was able to see completely and clearly. You go to the optician, they put those big goggles on you, and they drop the lenses in. What's it like now? What's it like now? I have to go see myself. I can hardly see at the moment. What's it like now? What's it like now? And they're dropping the lenses in and out. What's it like now? Read it now. Read the chart. Well, Jesus anoints him and he says, as the great physician, he's now the great optician. And he says, what do you see now? How's your healing? I see men as trees walking. You know what this tells me? We're never to give up because Christ always has a second touch. Sometimes it can be progressive, the things that God does in our lives and does in our bodies. Sometimes it progressively comes better. What do you see? I see men as trees walking. I'm not, it's not 2020 yet, Lord. I see what you're saying, Lord. I know what you're telling me this morning, Lord. I can understand a little of it. But give me another touch. Just one more touch. I'll see clearer. The second touch of Christ causes him to be restored the way he should have been. He restored to the former state. Do you know in Joel chapter 2 and verse 25, the Lord says, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. The Lord's speaking here, and he says to Israel, who have been decimated and scattered by their enemies, and he says, look, it looks like it's the end for you. People may look at you and say, you're finished, Israel. It's the end for you. You're scattered. You're all over the place. And he says, the Lord says, listen, because of your sin, this has happened. But look, he says, I'm the one who's placed my love on you. I'm the one who set my love on you. I'm the one who has kept you thus far. And I'm the one who is going to restore to you all these things that have happened in your life. In other words, he says, I'm going to make it up to you only better. I'm going to make it up to you only better. In times of our distress and our hurts, we wonder, Lord, how could you ever make this up to me? Don't understand it. I don't know how he does it, but I, all I know is he does. To me, he has. To me, he has. Every hurt, every trial, every pain, every pang of sorrow, every minute of mourning, He's made it up to me. And he says, I will restore to you those years. And sometimes we think that we talk of peace, that peace is the absence of storm, that peace is the absence of trial, that peace is the absence of tribulation and testing. And we think that that is the definition of peace. Peace in the scripture. That is not the definition of peace. Do you know what the definition of peace is? Peace is simply put like this. It's the presence of Christ. The 
trials may go and come, and storms may sweep my sky. This blood-sealed friendship changes not. The cross is ever nigh. It's having Christ in the storm, the trial, the trouble, the tribulation. It's having Christ in our withered situation and knowing that he is with us, that he is for us and not against us, that he is the one who's bringing us up, bringing us out, bringing us through, and he will somehow make what seemingly needs to be made up to us. By the way, he need not make anything up to us. He does it because he's gracious and kind. And the presence of Christ and what we're going through is what real peace is. It's peace to go through. It's peace to overcome the overcoming peace of God. In fact, in Joel chapter 2, when, it's, when the Lord promises to restore, the word for restore here is the word shalem. And it's the very akin to the root word of shalom. In the Hebrew, it's shalem, and it means peace. It means to make good. God says, I will make good to you that which you have lost. I will make good to you that which the canker worm has eaten and the caterpillar and the locust and all these things has come into your life. I will make it good to you. But you need to put your trust in me. You need to put your trust in me. Here this word, restore shalem, means peace or to make whole or to make good. In fact, in Joel chapter 2, if we were to take a a study at it and we won't this morning just let me run some things past you you read it when you go home do you know when Joel chapter 2 is it's in the new covenant speaking of the new covenant the actual idea here is I will restore it means through the covenant of peace that I will make and peace only comes through Christ but notice this just to back this up in Joel chapter 2 God speaks of the former and the latter reign. He speaks of the former reign and the latter reign. The former reign for the farmers was to help the the, the ear and the corn to spring up. The latter latter reign was a heavy deluge of rain to to make the the fruit or the the, the corn or, or, or the wheat or whatever was in the field. It was to mature it before harvest. And here we have the former outpouring of the Holy Ghost And then we have the latter-day outpouring of the Holy Ghost, one to spring up the church in power in Christ, and the other one here now is that revival blessing that comes to the believer and the heart of God through the baptism of the Spirit whenever that is matured enough. That maturity is for the harvest of God's people to be gathered in his corn to his garner. So here we're looking at the new covenant. First 25 of Joel 2 speaks of restoration from trouble, trial, and tribulation. First 26 speaks of grace and blessing and plenty. And it's a return to thanksgiving, listen, and true worship. It speaks of God blessing to such a degree and true worship. Coming to the Lord in the truth of his word and worshiping him in the spirit. How do we know this? Look at the next one. Verse 28 of Joel 2 says, uh, uh, Peter uses this. On the day of Pentecost, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. That's how I know I'm getting older. I dream every night. Literally every night. This is the new covenant. Listen, Christian. Listen, believer. You're in this covenant of God restoring, God making whole, God blessing, God giving peace and an abundance. You're in this covenant if you're in Christ. You're in this right now as you sit here, as you listen to this, you're in this. He's speaking to you and he says, I will restore to you. Everything you've lost, he will restore it again.
Now, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 13, the master made whole a withered arm. This man stretches forth, and he makes it whole on the account of Calvary. Now, Calvary hadn't happened, but in the mind of God, Calvary had already happened. It was as good as done. So everything revolves around Calvary. The Pharisees go out to, and they held a council against him how they might destroy him. Look at our reading in Matthew 12, and let your eye run down to verse 15. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healeth them all. Now, this shows me that Christ is not selfish, that he was never self-centered or self-absorbed. Think about it. He whom the angels worshipped. Again, John tells us that Isaiah saw him on his throne. And speaking of Isaiah chapter 6, you can read it when you go home. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And he talks about the cherubims around him crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And John says, Isaiah saw him. He whom he, the cherubim and, and the seraphim worshipped around the throne. He whom we're told angel and elder and all created things and beings and beasts alike fall down around the throne to worship him. The self same one, the great eternal I am, veiled and clothed in flesh. Notice this. He wasn't self-absorbed. Notice what it says in verse 15. The great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. Now, if that was you or I, we would say, you know what, I better withdraw myself, which he did, because my time has not yet come. But then multitudes start following, maybe saying, when you stop following me, folks, I have enough on the plate. Please stop following me. I, I can't cope anymore with all this. These men are out to get me. These men are out to kill me. These men are taking counsel against me, how they might destroy me. And listen, do not know the trouble that's coming my way. Do not know what I'm facing. Do not know the worries and the thoughts in my mouth or my mind. And, and he would say, you know, go away. We would say, go away. Please leave me alone. But the scriptures tells us Christ didn't say that. It says, and he healed them all. He healed them all. What he was doing was he was showing us a great example of what we should be. He was not inward looking, but he was outward thinking and outwardly creative, ministering to the crowd, even in the time of stress and these Pharisees gathering around him. Here's what I'd written whenever I was sitting thinking about this. Christ was not narcissistic. To be narcissistic means it comes from Greek mythology of their, i put it in brackets, uh, uh, what they believe was God. We know there only is one God. But Narcissus was a, a young man God from Greek mythology. And he was full of pride and there's no one like him. And Narcissus one day, those who loved him and he took love from everyone and all their worship and adoration and he treated them all with disdain as if they're lower level than him. So you've heard the word nemesis. Nemesis was a, a goddess of, of revenge in Greek mythology. So nemesis it says that she comes and she brings uh, Narcissus down to a, a, a pond. And she, she brings him to the edge of the pond. And as Narcissus looks in, he sees his reflection in the pond. And guess what? He falls in love with himself. And she leaves him with himself. And he falls in love with himself so much, he can't leave the pond anymore. In fact, he keeps looking and he keeps looking. And the more he looks, the more he loves himself. And this reflection looking back at him is just a vain, pale shadow. And it can give nothing back. And sooner, uh, sooner he realizes, the more I'm looking here, the more I'm loving. And 
he's starting to love which he was used to receiving all the time. And he was looking for something back. But this was just his reflection. And he was giving nothing back. And because he was getting nothing back, he was so self-absorbed that he had to go and commit suicide. That's the story of Narcissus. And the problem is that many Christians are so self-absorbed, we become narcissistic even in our fears. Look, brothers and sisters, I say this with the greatest respect, and I say it not wanting to offend, because I'm speaking to myself first. I had to say it to myself when I got up out of bed this morning. And you go and you look in the own mirror, and the hair's everywhere. And one eye's down here, and one eye's up there. And you have to put your teeth back in. And you're... And when you look at it, you maybe not like it, but sometimes we have to go to make sure we're in presentable shape. So I'm not saying anything about being presentable or, or knowing who we are in Christ. The idea is to know who we are in Christ, that we are in him, we are all things in him, but nothing of ourselves. But sometimes in our fears, in our worries, in our anxieties, and the things that come upon us, we get so self-absorbed. We're looking into the pond at ourselves and saying, you know, the world can't exist without you. Ken, see if you were to go away for a week and you come back to the church, do you think it'd still be there? I'm waiting on my reflection saying, Ken, Catch yourself on us, the Lord's church, not yours. I don't know what I'm going to do about this trouble. I don't know what I'm going to do about this situation. Oh, by the way, I'm looking into the pond in case you're wondering who I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do about this. And you know what we're doing? We take the sovereignty away from God. We take God's sovereignty away from our lives. We take God out of the equation who can do exceeding abundantly above all we could ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And we take him out of the situation and we become self-absorbed. Oh, I, I, I don't think I could go and pray for that person because what if it doesn't work? You only see yourself. Or I can't go and I can't witness or I can't do this. I know people get nervous and that's okay. We all get nervous in times. But when we get so self-absorbed that we get paralyzed by it, we end up with a withered hand. Brothers and sisters, it's time to lose sight of ourselves. If I raise my hands and worship and shout it, praise the Lord and hallelujah, they'll think I'm a nut. I'd rather people think I'm a nut and give praise to God and not give praise to God and the Lord say, where's my praise? Christ wasn't narcissistic. He looked out in spite of all things. He healed them all. And even though this Bible that we have, this gospel that we preach, and this is all about him. This book, see this, from 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 beginning to ending, from the first to the last, and it's all about him. Yet, do you know what happened? He made it all about us and his mind and his mission. He's not saved and she's not saved and they need forgiven and they'll be lost for all eternity. So he made it about me and he made it about you, but yet it's all about him. Do you get it? It's all about him, but he made it for you. We're afraid to worship and we're afraid to let go and praise and we're afraid to reach out and we're afraid to move. We're afraid. Church, you were never born for a destiny of fear, but you were born for a purpose. You were born with a plan in God's mind that he would save you, that he would fill you with his spirit and he would send you forth and that you would not see yourself, but only Christ and others and all around you. That's the idea of this whole gospel. It's not about me and it's not about you, but he made it about us because he loved us. 
because he loved us, so much he gave himself for us. You know, in our troubles and our tribulation, and if you read the book of Job, chapter 42, one verse at the very end of it, Job loses everything he has, even the respect he had in the street, and they're singing proverbs and songs about him and how he's lost it all. He lost his family and he lost his home and he lost his very health, his prestige. He lost it all. Job 42 and 10 says, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. The Lord gave him twice what he had before. Job, for a while, sat in dust and ashes. He looked into the mirror, into the pond of his own reflection. And the longer he found he did it, the longer and the more he died. But when he started to look out and to see the need, he started praying for those who came. Job's comforters had no comfort really at all for him. But when he came and prayed for them, God says, now you've got it, Job. And he blessed them. I've only got one point done of an hour or two. We'll have to do it another morning. Let me finish this point anyway. Matthew 12 and 17. Look at what it says. The Lord says, Matthew writes, that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show forth judgment unto the Gentiles. Really the word judgment can be termed our justice. He'll be one of justice to bring truth and righteousness. But notice this, you know, the word here, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen. The word here for chosen is the word hartezo. And this is what it means. It means to choose by reason of suitability. To choose by reason of suitability. In other words, the father is looking now at his beloved son and he's saying to you and he's saying to me and he says to those Pharisees who are in that Jewish synagogue and he says to all who are around him, he says, now here's whom I want you to look at this morning. Here's what I want you to see in all of these matters, issues and problems that you have. He says, behold my servant. No, he didn't even say, behold my son. Look at him serve me. Here's a great example. You see, when we don't receive back what we think from others that we should, you know what happens? Our hand withers. Our reed gets bruised, and our flax begins to smoke instead of being fire and give light. And he says, I'm not getting back what I should be getting back. Narcissus said, you, 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 you may as well go, he says, there's no more love for you. Narcissus, you may as well go and finish it. But there's so much for the man and there's so much for the woman in Christ who even come to that place. Listen, that place of, of, of depression and that place of, of, of hurt and that place where even suicide comes to their mind, and there's no more, no joy from the world. And the idea is that, look, if you can just really drop it into your mind, it's not the joy you get, but it's the joy you're giving. You mean something to someone else. You mean something to someone else. You, brother and you, sister, are something to someone else. And maybe they just rest on you. He says, look at my servant. He's serving, not expecting in return. He's serving, not asking for anything back. He says, he's coming because I love him and that's enough. Did you hear that, brother? Listen, do you hear that, sister? He says, he's serving me because I love him and that's enough for him. Can I love you? Don't expect anything in return. My love 
is enough for you. Did you hear that, brother, sister? Stop depending on others' love to keep the fires aflame in your heart, but rather depend on the love of a, God, of a Father God who loves you everlastingly. Stop depending on others and, and their applauses because once we look to the applause of man, we have lost our very mission for God. I believe it's good to encourage, brother, sister. I believe it's good to encourage. But I believe it's dangerous from when we look for applause rather than serve God, whether we get it or not. He says, look at, behold my servant. You may not respect him, and you may not want him, and you may not love him. You may seek to destroy him. You may hold your counsel against him. And you may say, you know what? Let's go and do something wrong in him. You may want to defame her. You may want to defame her, him. You may want to say something bad against him or her. But look at my servants. Look at the one who served me because they love me. You may not see them, he says, but I do. But I do. Behold my servant whom I have chosen. This word chosen here, as I said, gives the idea, it speaks, it means to choose of, by reason of suitability. And I'll be finished in two minutes, so stay with me. To choose by reason of suitability. What do you mean, Father, when you say, look at him? In other words, he says, I have searched all of heaven. And I've searched all of the earth. And I've searched near and far. And mine eye that sees all things. None was worthy. You see, the Bible tells me, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understand and seeketh after God. John, Revelation chapter 5, John writes of how he's shown a vision of glory in heaven and, and the elders and all the angels cannot open the book and loose the seals thereof and there's wailing in heaven. Believe it or not, there's wailing in heaven. And John feels the tear come to his eye and says, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And there, everything just falls apart, as it were, before him. And everyone is in mourning and in wailing. What are we going to do? There's no one able. And then someone, a voice from the very side of John says, don't cry, John. He says, for the lion of the tribe of Judah, he says, is worthy. The Lord says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen. I've searched everywhere, and there's none worthy. Only him. Just him. He's the only one suitable for the job. And when you are in him in this new covenant of peace and blessing, this shalom covenant, when you're in him, Christian, listen to me, when you're in him, then all whom he is is all whom you are and attain to be seated in Christ in heavenly places. And when you're serving him because you love him, people may not see it, know it, not want anything to do with it. They may come to try and hold a counsel against you. They may try to destroy you, put you out of their sight and defame you. They may say all manner of things against you. But see, when you're standing there or you're walking or you're serving them children or whatever you're doing, you're up here bringing the word or you're playing in the group and you're leading the worship. You know something? See, whenever all others would do this and go, oh, that's not right and that's not good and that's not this or you're out there cleaning the, the very toilet's body. The Lord sees it all and the Lord says, behold my servant. You're suitable. For when all others Hoover the floor for a week or two and give it up. Batty kept going and Margaret and others. Isn't that right, Batty? And all others would pick up the mantle and set it down again so quickly. 
the Lord says, look at him, look at her. Behold the one I have found suitable for a ministry. Gary, you have a ministry that God has given you and that mantle will never be taken off you. It's going to be taken away. Here we find the Lord's looking at his children and his people, Sunday schools, youth, whatever we're doing. He says, behold my servant. You look at them. You may not recognize them. He says, but I do. And I've found them suitable. Maybe you're a prayer warrior at home and you can't really get out then. That's your ministry. And he sees you where you are. So, Isaiah the prophet is known as the fifth evangelist. I'm only just getting into that too. Isaiah the prophet is known as the fifth evangelist. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Isaiah because of his prophecies. And the thing about it is, is that he's mentioned some nine times in the book of Matthew. Nine times. And as he's mentioned nine times in Matthew, you'll find that what the Lord is doing is he's fulfilling these scriptures as he goes along. And then it says, a bruised reed shall he not break, a smoking flax shall he not quench. We'll look at that again. Might have to break for Easter next week, but we'll look at it again. There's so much more. And maybe you have a withered hand this morning. Maybe you feel a bruised reed and maybe you're a smoking flax, God will breathe on you. Hear the word, answer the call, stretch forth the withered hand and he'll restore you, make you whole as the other. Give it up to God and let all the past hurts go and watch him bring you into newness of life and anointed ministry with him. The Lord bless you.